In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. We observe silence for self-examination. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. He's called an ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday in Lent is from Jeremiah chapter 26. When Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, This man deserves the sentence of death because he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your own ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and in this city all of the words you have heard. Now therefore mend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will relent of the disaster that he has pronounced against you. But as for me, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me as it seems good and right to you. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. This is the word of the Lord.
The epistle is from Philippians chapter 3 and 4. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. <coughs> The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. We confess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <laughs> Oh, I swear. 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon text is from Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. In your anger, do not sin. When on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Today in America, we live in a profoundly angry culture. Anger is all the rage this election year. In a crowd of candidates, you have to do something to stand out, right? And it seems like the presidential candidates are resorting to anger. Sometimes it seems they're even pretending to be angry in order to appeal to angry voters. Today, anger is in vogue. It's almost a virtue in our culture. We applaud people who angrily go off and belittle someone whom we think deserves it. As Christians, we find ourselves living in an angry culture and we kid ourselves if we think that this tolerance of anger isn't wiggling its way into the church. But this isn't just about the culture or the church. This is about you and me as individuals. I too have a temper. And I've noticed that whenever I'm angry, I rarely do or say the wise or loving thing. To be sure, when I'm angry, I have lots of energy to do something, to say something. But whenever I give in to my anger, things usually turn out badly. I end up hurting someone. The sermon is about anger more specifically, but what the Bible says about anger. And God's word seems to be making the case that for us as humans, it's nearly impossible to get angry without also sinning. We all get angry. And we all like to think when we're angry that our anger is just anger, righteous anger. For Christians, however, the place to start that conversation is with the scriptures. What does God's word say about anger? In the Bible, especially in, God, in the Old Testament, it seems God is often angry. It's, it's not because anger is God's nature or his resting state, not at all. Exodus 34 tells us what his nature is. He is, quote, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's who he is. That's his resting state. So why does he seem so angry? It's because we, as sinners, keep doing things to provoke his anger as a holy God. Think of it this way. A, God is slow to anger. B, God is often angry, especially at his people. C, therefore, what can we conclude? God's people have given him plenty of reasons to be angry. God's anger in the Bible says more about us and our nature than it does about God and his nature. What about people? who are angry in the Bible. Plenty of people get angry, but there are very few texts in which one might conclude the anger was justified or righteous or praiseworthy. Instead, there are plenty of examples where human anger causes great sin. Remember Cain and Abel? Genesis 4, so Cain was very angry. The Lord warns Cain of his anger. He says, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. That is, don't give in to it. Of course, Cain ignores that. It's no accident that the first mention of anger in the Bible is immediately prior to the first murder in the Bible. God's word, especially in Proverbs, links human anger with fools and sin, few examples. Proverbs 14, a man of quick temper acts foolishly. Proverbs 15, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Proverbs 16, better the man who is slow to anger than a mighty warrior. Better the man who controls his temper than the one who conquers the city. 
Proverbs 22, make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and become entangled in his snares. When we see wicked people doing wicked things, it makes us angry. And most of us would like to call that righteous anger. But listen to Psalm 37. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways and carry out their wicked schemes. Remarkable thing to say, right? Even when their wicked men are getting away with it, don't get angry. Refrain from anger, it says, and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. Jesus expands on this. The classic passage is from the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and whoever does so will be liable to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Remarkable. Elsewhere in the New Testament, anger or wrath are simply added to the list of sins, as if by their very nature, they are sin. 2 Corinthians 12, For I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, disorder. Anger is just another sin on that list. Galatians 5, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, enmity, strife, fits of anger, dissensions, division, and the like. I warn you, Paul says, as I've warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And again in Ephesians 4, get rid of all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander along with every form of malice. We all want to think our anger is righteous anger. But there's nothing about righteous anger of man in the Bible. There are only lots of warnings of the spiritual dangers of anger. In the Bible, the one who is patient and self-controlled, that one is truly the sage. That one's the wise man. Whereas the one who has fits of anger in the Bible is condemned as a fool. Is the anger of God's people in the Bible ever a good thing? The answer is not really. Sometimes it's overlooked without pointing it out. But one suspects that's just for the sake of the narrative, for the story. You can't stop a story every time somebody gets angry and say, look here, he's angry and that's inappropriate. We might think of Moses' anger uh, as righteous anger, especially when he came down the mountain and saw the calf and the dancing and the idolatry. The text says his anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them. Was that righteous anger? Just because Moses displayed anger and won't, wasn't punished for it that we know of, that's hardly an endorsement of anger. Another example might be when the people's constant grumbling finally pushes Mo Moses over the edge at Meribah. And in anger, he struck the rock with the staff twice. We can certainly identify with his frustration. Not a big deal, we think. At least he didn't hit somebody else with the staff. But it was a big deal to God. As a consequence for his anger, Moses never got to set foot in the promised land. Very few examples in the Bible of what we would call righteous anger, and even those are up for debate. Now, our sermon text says, in your anger do not sin. When you're on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. It recognizes the reality of anger, but just as quickly puts a control on it. When you're angry, search your hearts, be silent. James says something similar. Let every person be slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. 
overall, the picture is the Bible is within a whisker of saying that man's anger is always and intrinsically sinful. Contemporary American society admires those who speak out in anger and insult and belittle another individual or group. I think that's part of the Trump phenomenon. But as Christians, we have the responsibility to stand out and to be different from the culture. We're called to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Even when we feel angry at the injustice or the evil or the immorality of the world around us, we cannot call that righteous anger and then use that to justify our actions or our, our, our words. God can be angry in a righteous way because that's who he is. He's holy. He's righteous without sin. But we are not God. We are saints and sinners simultaneously. So we have to be very careful with this thing, this emotion called anger. Instead of getting angry, we have this from Paul. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse them. Live in harmony with one another. Repay no one evil for evil. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Notice there's a place for anger in this text. But it's not with the disciples of Jesus. It belongs to God alone. Apparently, vengeance is too dangerous a weapon to place into the hands of sinners. Some have said, but anger motivates you to get up and do something, to fix it. Should it require anger to move me to action? Shouldn't compassion do the same? Love? Mercy? Well, the reality is you and I are sinners living among other sinners, and we're going to get angry, so suppose you're angry really angry. Maybe it's this sermon on anger that has ticked you off. What do you do when you're angry? First, one very good option is to do or say nothing. Our text says, in your anger, do not sin. Lie on your beds and be silent. That's, that ancient advice turns out to be very wise because brain science tells us that the fight or flight part of the brain is very fast. That's its advantage. Whereas the reasonable part of the brain is, is slower. So to step back and pause gives a reasonable part of the brain to catch up to the fight or flight part. There's a new phone app that, out there that won't let you text anything when you've had too much to drink. Maybe there should be something similar when you're angry. Because chances are you're just going to say something dumb, right? It's going to make you look like a fool. It's going to inflare emotions. Don't write any emails or texts or tweets or anything when you're angry. Chances are it will lead to sin and make you look like a fool, at least in God's eyes. Be slow to anger. Second, trust that the Lord's vengeance is totally adequate. As Paul wrote, do not take revenge. Leave room for God's wrath. In his own time, in his own way, God will bring about justice without the sin, without the collateral casualties. Third, try to explain everything in the kindest way. Maybe the one who didn't greet you wasn't trying to diss you. Maybe she was distracted by something going on in, in her own life. Fourth, Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Maybe in part because it's hard to hate someone you're praying for or even be angry with that one. Fifth, pray, Paul wrote, as much as possible, be at peace with one another. Work toward that peace. Lean in during those circumstances. It doesn't come easily, but it's always well worth the efforts. Sixth, if action is necessary, do it according to Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. Not with everyone else. Not with everyone else. 
just between the two of you. If that doesn't work, take along two or three witnesses. If that still doesn't work, tell it to the church and so on. <laughs> Seventh, seek out a safe and careful listener, not for the sake of slandering the one with whom you're angry, but for the sake of getting advice and support. Keep it anonymous. Again, our Stephen ministers can be helpful here. Eighth, if you're often angry, maybe it's time to seek professional help. A skilled counselor who can dis help you discover why. God uses such people to help us. And finally, perhaps most importantly, forgive the one who has sinned against you in place of getting angry. If it was a big hurt, that won't be a, a one and done sort of forgiveness. That will be a lot of work leading up to the forgiveness and then a lot of work after that initial forgiveness. A 70 times seven sort of forgiveness as you day after day resolve again and again to tamp down that resurging anger. One last thing. The gospel is going to get short shrift today, okay? So here it is. I don't want you to miss it after all that law. Listen up. The most important teaching about anger in the Bible is that the Father has provided a way out by actually using anger. He saved us from his white-hot righteous wrath by turning its focus away from us and narrowing it, focusing it on his son, Jesus. And Jesus himself refrained from responding in anger, so in order to save us. He didn't lash out. He was falsely accused, falsely sentenced, slapped, spit on, whipped, beaten up, mocked, and then ultimately crucified. If there were ever an opportunity for a burst of righteous anger, it would have been there on the cross. But he didn't retaliate. He didn't unleash a stream of profanity or verbal abuse. He didn't go on the attack. He held his tongue and unclenched his fist in order to save us from the sin of our anger. Romans 5, Paul writes, God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Thanks be to God. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. In our prayers, we pray for those who are in need of our prayers. For Norm Marquardt, um, father of Brenda Maynard, who has been ill. For Bob Maynard, Maynard uh, brother of Dan, who has also been ill. For Jeff Schlewe as he recovers from that car accident. For Esther Utech in hospice care. For Bill Kleiman and Sue Faltonson and Kent Kraus. And for those who are deployed, Zach Kasubi, Zach Krieger. Please stand for prayer. As people invited to believe that God is our true father and that we are his true children, let us pray with all boldness and confidence in the way that dear children speak to their father. For the church, that our Lord gather his people as a hen gathers her chicks, keep them in the true faith, that he unite his church by his word and sacrament and defend her from all enemies of the cross of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our sisters and brothers in Christ who, like Jeremiah, are persecuted for doing the Lord's will, that God grant them courage, confidence, and boldness to confess Jesus, trusting him who has conquered death. And let us pray for their persecutors that the God who wants all people to be saved turn all enemies of the gospel to repentance and to faith. 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For our own lives of faith, that God grant us, as he granted Jeremiah, faith that responds to threats with the firm conviction that we will obey the Lord, no matter the consequences, and that he engender in us confidence that his son's resurrection delivers us even from death. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all who are troubled by addictions, that our Lord would show them mercy, assure them of forgiveness, break the bonds that enslave them, and by his promises, strengthen them to overcome their addictions. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For when we are angry, that our Lord would help us not to sin, but to ponder in our hearts and be silent. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For those who are struggling with disease or trouble, for Norm, Bob, Jeff, Esther, Bill, Sue, Kent, and those whom we name in our hearts. That the God whose son promised to drive out demons, heal the sick, and provide each of them with peace, patience, encouragement, and an end to their suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For hearts and minds eager to give back to our bountiful God that by the working of the Holy Spirit, we thankfully and willing, willingly return to him the first fruits of all he gives to us, that he would use those offerings to extend his kingdom of grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For those who govern us, that our Father would guide them by his spirit and fill them with wisdom, conviction, care, and a clear understanding of what is good and right and that he provide our land with peaceful and judicious citizens. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have For those who serve in the military, that our Father would protect their lives and give them bravery, loyalty, strength, and reliability for their tasks, especially for Zachary Kasubi and Zachary Krieger. Let us pray to the Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
continue with the preface on page 208. The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. At your command, Abraham prepared to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain. Yet in mercy, you provided a ram as a substitute. We give you thanks that on Calvary, you spared not your only son, but sent him to offer his life as a ransom for many. As we eat and drink his body and blood, grant us, like Abraham our father, to trust in your promise now fulfilled in Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.